Thank you. Um, this is Randy Camphouse, and um, uh, I have uh, 90 minutes here uh, that I think we can fill quite easily because uh, there's much to talk about with the new BAS-3. Uh, some of you have already adopted the BAS-3, so uh, uh, I regret that I'm going to pitch this at individuals who are uh, thinking about transitioning to the BAS-3. I'm also going to pitch this presentation at individuals who um, have used the BASC-2 or something quite similar to the BASC-2 and assume some transfer of training. So I'll look forward to uh, your questions. Um, Anne-Marie is uh, quite a capable uh, uh, responder to your questions, so I, I think you'll find her doing a very good job for you as well. But uh, I will keep my eye on them to uh, uh, assist as uh, appropriate. So the BASC-3, um, if you remember nothing else uh, from this particular presentation, um, is uh, strikingly similar to the BASC-2. At first, that may not uh, look like it's the case uh, because we have new colors, we have new logo, we have uh, a few new scores. But generally speaking, the derived scores are the same, the scales are the same, um, and so if you've uh, used the BAS-2 previously, there is considerable transfer of training to the BASC-3. Even the Q Global system, uh, which seems very different from the uh, old scoring system we had for the BAS-2, uh, includes a number of screens and output that essentially was just ported over from the BASC-2. So uh, if you've uh, logged into Q Global previously, you'll see some screens um, that look uh, very similar to the BAS-2 screens, and that's because they were um, ported over. So if you're thinking about transitioning to the BAS-3 um, and you've used the BAS-2 previously, you should be able to do so with great confidence. Now, in the um, interest of time, I'm, um, going to skip a few slides uh, to try to um, make sure that we cover the, the material that people usually have questions about <coughs> with regard to the BASC-3. And I'm going to skip uh, to slide 8, <coughs> or at least uh, attempt to on uh, my machine here. Here you go. Okay. I'm going to move past these and move directly to uh, slide eight here. And um, this, uh, those previous slides, um, I say for uh, lengthier presentations on the BASC-3, because they explain why the BASC-3 has um, a few additional options and more components than the BASC-2. And the reason why we have these new components and we updated um, the major components is to make sure that we're um, meeting all the needs of practitioners who are serving children today. One of those needs, for example, is the, the need for universal screening to try to detect children with behavioral and emotional risk uh, that is uh, pretty much unknown to parents, teachers, and others. And that's the behavioral and emotional screening system that you see there on the top. Toward the bottom, third bullet from the bottom, you see the flex monitor there. And the flex monitor uh, is an attempt to make progress monitoring of children's behavior and emotional adjustment uh, more convenient and more accurate. And given the increased emphasis on accountability, uh, that's ever more important. So we offer the uh, flex monitor uh, as an updated set of tools um, that are uh, needed these days for delivering comprehensive and accountable and evidence-based services to children. So uh, moving along, um, another way of depicting the, uh, the BAS-3 is to think about uh, these four aspects of assessment practice where screening is associated with prevention. And this is why we've uh, spent several years now working on revising and refining the behavioral emotional screening system. Assessment 
for comprehensive understanding of children's adjustment. And this, that's where you have the three core rating scales, teacher, parent, and self-report, uh, just as you did on the past two. Uh, parenting and relationship questionnaire, structured developmental history. And then for intervention, we had the behavioral intervention guide, which is considerably updated, expanded, and made more practical. And the behavioral and emotional skill building design, uh, guide designed for uh, prevention and uh, secondary prevention services. And then, uh, as I mentioned, the flex monitor, um, also the student observation system, uh, the continuous performance test is no longer uh, part of the VAS-3, so um, I regret this uh, slide has not been updated. So we have the SOS and the flex monitor there. So uh, as I mentioned at the outset, um, there are a number of goals with regard to the revision, uh, but the essential one is on this slide here, where you see that 32% of the items are new on the teacher and parent rating scales, and there are considerably uh, new, considerable new items on the self-report of personality as well. So, bottom line, the BASC-3 um, uh, is easy for you to pick up if you've used the BAS-2 because most of the changes are under the hood, so to speak. Um, they're really invisible uh, to most users because we worked very hard to improve item content, which in turn improved reliability for the individual scales. And uh, uh, when you see the data later and look at the manual, you'll see improved reliability coefficients across the board. And this has resulted in improvements in validity. So you can now have more confidence in your interpretation of scores on the BASC-3 uh, than was even the case on the BASC-2. So some of this change in item content is uh, shown there on the additional bullets on this slide, uh, where we worked really hard to improve the content scales. So we have significant new items on the executive functioning scale, so much so that that has allowed us, with the assistance of uh, Mauricio Garcia Barrera, to revise um, the executive functioning scale to produce four subscale scores. Problem solving, attentional control, behavioral control, and emotional control. And for those of you who have used the BAS-2, you know that the developmental social disorder scale is essentially an autism scale. We just named it developmental social disorder, or in short form, DSD. We gave it that title because we wanted to make it easier for you to work with parents, teachers, school administrators, and others in the case of false positives. So for example, uh, on an autism scale, you can get high scores due to the presence of an autism spectrum disorder. You can also get elevated scores due to intellectual disability. And if, you, uh, if a child, according to parent or teacher rating, has a DSD score that's elevated because of awkward or unusual behaviors that might be associated with a severe intellectual disability, uh, you, it's certainly easier to explain that they have social problems, hence the name developmental social disorder, associated with the intellectual disability, as opposed to autism per se. As you well know, if you had an elevated autism score, that would be very difficult to explain to parents, it would be very difficult to explain that that might be a false positive in this particular case. So DSD is a euphemistic name that's intended to give you the flexibility of identifying autism in the case of a particular child's uh, presenting problems versus intellectual disability or something else that created a false positive on the DSD scale. So, um, significant improvements in all the content scales, and I will cover those. 
particularly executive functioning because that is so important these days uh, because of the higher frequency of sports-related uh, concussions and mild brain injuries that uh, children and adolescents experience, and in addition, uh, the continuing importance of differential diagnosis of autism, we improve the DSD scale. So these are the scale types, just as was the case in the VAST two: clinical, adaptive, content, composite, the index scales are the only new ones, and I'll explain these to you uh, when we encounter them in a succeeding slide. Clinical scales uh, are as before, and what I've done for you is I've created uh, for the TRS, PRS, and the self-reported personality the, the core of the VAS-3 that's used most um, frequently by clinicians. I create a few uh, slides that for each subscale list an existing item, and you see that there in the black um, print. For hyperactivity, uh, an existing item on the VAS-2 that was carried over to the VAS-3 is acts without thinking. And then I um, include an item in uh, the blue or purple color there is in constant motion. These are new items. And these are new items that we tried out with the VAS-3. They turned out to be better than previous items, and so uh, they were added to the VAS-3 to improve content coverage, to improve reliability, and to improve validity. I'll also note for you that we also uh, kept the uh, length in check. So when we did add a new item, we uh, typically removed an existing item that had inferior item properties. And then for each scale, as you see in hyperactivity there, I include a uh, couple of words or phrase there uh, with a question mark after it. In the case of hyperactivity, the question mark is, is impulsivity present? So for the hyperactivity scale, there are a few impulsivity items embedded within that scale. And it's for this reason why on the Q Global reports, we include the individual items on the rating scales as output for you to review and the individual item responses. And that will allow you to look at the hyperactivity scale. Let's say you get a T-score of 65 or 66, somewhat elevated but not extraordinarily high. Um, and you make the conclusion that this uh, child or adolescent is overactive, hyperactive, their motor is running too quickly. You can look at the items and see if impulsivity is present as well because uh, hyperactivity or a high activity level in and of itself is not maladaptive. Uh, in fact, a high activity level can be quite adaptive. It can be uh, associated with very high career performance in adulthood uh, and in childhood, uh, very high productivity as well. So for um, uh, some gifted children, for example, uh, they may have trouble uh, sitting still in school. Uh, they might uh, stand by their desk, but at the same time, they might very well be getting straight A's because they do not have impulsivity problems, or as we'll see later, attention difficulties. So if you have hyperactivity with impulsivity, that suggests a poor prognosis. That suggests more behavioral and emotional risk for that particular child because it's the impulsivity that is associated with the bad decision-making, which can interfere with social adjustment, um, bad decision-making in school, outside of school, that causes a child or adolescent to get into trouble. And that's why I present that interpretive question for you there. With aggression, same thing. Uh, bullies others is an existing item that was carried over to the VAS-3. Manipulates others uh, is a new item that turns out to be better than some of the previous aggression scale items, uh, and it assesses interpersonal uh, aggressive tendencies. And the question for this scale is, is physical aggression present? Because 
uh, it's quite possible to get a T-score of 60, 65, 70 on the aggression scale. And it's all due to this interpersonal aggression, this bullying, this manipulation, or verbal aggression. And physical aggression items may not be rated by parents or teachers. So um, uh, I give you that question for you to help clarify your interpretation of the aggression scale. Uh, is it aggression that includes bullying, interpersonal manipulation, and physical aggression, or is it just the former two? Because, so we, because of the name of the scale, we don't want to give the misimpression that this child is in imminent danger to self or others if, for example, they have no history of physical aggression. Conduct problems. Uh, we have an old item, disobeys. We have a new item, hurts others on purpose. This is the third of the externalizing scales. Um, the reason we put the hurts others on purpose item there is because we want to update the item content to be more consistent with recent research. And our colleagues, such as Paul Frick at uh, Louisiana State University, have done some really nice research um, showing that conduct problems uh, cause difficulties in school and outside of school. But conduct problems combined with um, uh, intent to hurt others, such as hurting others on purpose, suggests a callousness. Uh, and that callousness is associated with more adjust adjustment difficulties. So again, it's another reason, if you wish to um, uh, look at the item responses, if you have a very high score on conduct problems, and see if the few callousness items we have there, such as hurting others on purpose, are marked. If that's the case, then you might have conduct problems plus what the more recent research is showing callous, unemotional traits associated with that, which is um, much more problematic for adjustment. Then on the internalizing scales here, we have anxiety, depression, somatization. Our anxiety scale includes a new item, has trouble making decisions. Um, depression has a new item, which is sort of a negative cognition item. Um, I can't do anything right. And somatization has a new item, complaining of physical problems. And so these new items uh, imp improve the content coverage of these scales as well, so that hopefully you um, get better detection of anxiety problems with the anxiety scale. Um, the anxiety scale can give you a false negative, uh, because sometimes younger children in particular um, they may not express a lot of fears. They may not express a lot of worry. But they may express their anxiety in the form of not feeling well. And if that's the case, their anxiety may be expressed more on the somatization scale. And the somatization scale could be measuring anxiety for that young child. So. Um, if you have an anxiety scale that's negative, no problems indicated, a somatization scale that is positive, problems are indicated, then I would ask myself two questions. Number one, is that anxiety scale, or is that somatization scale elevated due to the child being ill, having a long-term illness, for example? Or is that somatization scale elevated because the child is highly anxious. Um, and so if the child does not seem to be ill at this point in time, uh, there's no documentation of that, a high somatization score might be as good an indicator of the presence of anxiety as the anxiety scale. And that's why those interpretive questions are there. Depression. The depression scale, like hyperactivity, for example, is exceedingly accurate. If a child um, gets a high score on the depression scale, it indicates significant unhappiness. And if it meets or exceeds diagnostic criteria for depression, then uh, it would indicate uh, 
that, that that diagnosis is warranted. The reason I put the question there, subsyndromal unhappiness, is because it could be that a child is lonely, upset, sad, but not to the extent that it would warrant making the depression diagnosis. And so uh, I would like to give you permission, if you pick up the BAS-3, to, uh, in those cases, not use the label for the scale depression, because depression does sound like a disorder. And change the name in conversations with parents, teachers, um, therapists, etc., to communicate more accurately the result. And if the result is unhappiness, not severe enough to be depression, I would feel very comfortable describing this test result as an indicator of a child's unhappiness so that uh, the child is not stigmatized with the depressive disorder uh, unnecessarily. So I spent quite a bit of time on these externalizing, internalizing scales on the parent-teacher rating scales. And I do so because most, those are the majority of questions that I receive um, from BAS2 users and BAS3 users for that matter, um, because these are the scales that are used heavily in everyday assessment practice uh, with children to assess the hyperactivity that might be associated with suspected ADHD, um, the um, internalizing problems as expressed on the depression scale, et cetera. I'll go a bit more quickly with um, most of the remaining scales so that I can cover uh, the various components of the BAS reaches um, uh, to introduce them to you to at least some extent. So moving to uh, additional TRS, PRS scales, uh, this slide is also important because you have the other half of the ADHD diagnosis, the attention problem scale. And this is the scale that is more highly negatively correlated with academic achievement in school. So uh, hyperactivity in the absence of impulsivity uh, is not highly correlated. That's very poorly correlated with academic outcomes. Attention problems, on the other hand, is uh, 0 0.60, 0 0.70, depending upon the investigation, negatively correlated with uh, academic achievement measures in reading, mathematics, etc. So uh, a child may be sitting or, or standing at his or her desk, uh, tapping their foot, um, and getting straight A's. Or they may be uh, standing at their desk, tapping their foot, and not doing well in school. Uh, but it's not because of their activity level. It's because they have attention problems. So this, uh, elevations on this scale should be associated with academic impairment. And then the other question I give you there is, is this due to a non-ADHD etiology? So the attention problem scale is exceedingly accurate, like depression hyperactivity, has reliability coefficients of about 0.90 or better. So it gives you very accurate detection. What it doesn't tell you are the causes of the attention problems. And this is why Cecil uh, Reynolds and I originally created the structured developmental history that we'll talk about later, was to help you sort out the etiology for these score elevations. And so for attention problems, hyperactivity, suspected ADHD, um, history taking is crucial. Uh, for example, uh, you may encounter a child or adolescent, you probably have if you've been in the field for a while, who um, suddenly uh, starts to have attention and hyperactivity problems. If it's a sudden onset, it's probably not ADHD, uh, because ADHD uh, is, not, is a developmental disorder. It's not characterized by a sudden onset. Uh, in those cases, you could have attention problems and hyperactivity that are elevated, but they're due to uh, treatment for cancers associated with some attention problems. Um, al allergy medications are associated with some attention problems. Thyroid conditions are associated with attention problems. Depression is associated with attention and hyperactivity problems. There can be a variety 
of non-ADHD causes for attentional difficulties uh, and hyperactivity difficulties for that matter. So this is why with the PRS and the TRS, uh, we emphasize good history taking, uh, whether it's done by a, another person involved in the assessment process or done by yourself. Um, it's, it's very important to bring more understanding of the scale elevations, the causes, the developmental course of the child's difficulties, and the rating scales just don't give you that sort of insight that comes from um, qualitative assessment, uh, history taking specifically. Learning problems, uh, same as the VAST2, but with improved item content. Uh, and for the learning problem scale, uh, we're trying to uh, screen essentially for academic difficulties. The attention problem scale does that, and the learning problem scale uh, does that as well. Um, so these two scales should tend to go together in cases of uh, ADHD combined type, uh, very significant, very severe reading disability, written expression disability, et cetera. And then we have atypicality and withdrawal there. Um, and these are the two scales that are part of the BASC intended to assess very severe forms of psychopathology. The atypicality scale, for those of you who have used the BASC two, you know that this scale is challenging to interpret. Um, and uh, it's challenging because it is, in effect, a psychoticism scale, a psychotic behavior scale. And psychotic behavior scales just don't work very well for assessing psychotic behavior, uh, ironically. And the reason for that is that psychotic behavior, a la schizophrenia, has such a low base rate in the population. It's a very rare problem to detect. And when you're trying to detect a rare problem, it limits the variability uh, of responding on each item, which in turn uh, in turn limits reliability, which in turn limits validity. So we've always known that psychoticism scales were going to produce false positives. And this is why uh, we don't call this a psychoticism scale, because it's too hard to explain why a psychoticism scale is not assessing psychoticism. And this is why we give it this vague term, atypicality, just as we did with the developmental social disorder scale. So you're um, uh, in charge of interpreting this scale. You have the flexibility to say, yes, it's a case of psychoticism. It's a case of childhood schizophrenia, for example. But that's going to be very rare unless you're working in an inpatient institution. And if you're working in an inpatient institution where the prevalence rate is higher, the atypicality scale is going to work uh, better. Uh, it's going to uh, function more as a psychoticism scale. Working outside of those more restricted settings, a high atypicality score is going to be uh, probably most likely interpreted as an indicator of awkward and unusual behaviors that are associated with significant cognitive impairment or intellectual disability. In addition, you'll have some parents or teachers that will interpret atypicality items as hyperactivity items. In those cases, um, I would explain to a parent or other uh, consumer of these results that the atypicality scale is just another reflection of the hyperactivity scale, which is also elevated for this child. So those are a couple of interpretations for the atypicality scale that you'll probably use relatively frequently and less frequently interpret this as, for example, childhood schizophrenia. The withdrawal scale is not a shyness uh, scale. It's pretty significant withdrawal. And that's why the question below the uh, new item there, isolate self from others, asks, is this really due to intellectual disability or autism spectrum disorder. And so uh, that's the question for both of these scales if they measure pretty severe forms of maladjustment. Um, uh, they're typically associated with those two diagnoses. 
This is why we created the Developmental Social Disorders Scale, because in the 1992 edition to the 2004 edition, and then independent researchers who don't have the conflict of interest that Cecil and I have with the BASC uh, too, um, created uh, or conducted research studies to show that this is in fact the high point pair for um, kids with autism. So uh, we took these items from atypicality and withdrawal and we conducted, we constructed the DSD scale and improved it further for uh, the BASC-3, and I will show you those improvements. Um, these are the adaptive scales, and uh, you'll see here we updated the item content re to reflect changes in the English language, cultural changes uh, in the U.S. and elsewhere. Uh, to give you an example, on activities of daily living, uh, you'll now uh, hear preschoolers and their teachers talk more about healthy food choices as we try to head off um, poor eating, fat, uh, poor eating uh, behaviors in younger children. Uh, similarly, for social skills, you'll see that um, we have a uh, sort of a tolerance, a uh, tolerance for cultural differences item there such as accepts people who are different from his or herself. So uh, uh, this is an example of what I mentioned at the outset where uh, in the third of the new items we focused on significantly improving item content to uh, be more aligned with changes in the English language because there are significant changes from decade to decade, uh, but also changes in cultural values, etc. Leadership, study skills, functional communication are the same as they were on the VAST II. Just a quick word about functional communication. Uh, this is the only deviant, deviant scale for children with diagnosed speech language hearing problems. So we have enough data on those samples to report their profile in the VAST III manual, just as we did for the VAST II. And what you see for kids with speech language hearing problems is that their T-scores are about 50 on every scale, except for functional communication, where they're about 45, about a half standard deviation below the mean on that adaptive scale, where, of course, a positive score um, is an indicator of more positive ad adaptation. All right. TRS and PRS, the content scales, as you see here, we have a, two new items given for each scale. And this is where we worked hard to improve these scales. They were somewhat experimental on the BAST II. Um, and we created these scales based upon the items that were already included in the BASC II. Well, for the BAST III, we created unique items for the content scales that are not on any other BASC clinical or content scale. And that's why these are in that purple sort of color. So these are new items unique to these scales, uh, which significantly strengthen the coverage, the content coverage of the construct, um, and at the same time, um, strengthen reliability and validity. So um, those of you who used it in BASC too may have noticed that in the manual, we refer to the content scales as optional content scales. We don't do that in the BAST three because we have significant more data, significantly more uh, content, and significantly more psychometric evidence to suggest that you can interpret these with greater confidence. So anger control does uh, uh, assess anger in a better way, more comprehensive way than uh, was the case in the BAST two. The bullying scale is much improved. And the autism scale, DSD, uh, as you see here, has new, uh, three new items that, are, uh, that come from the autism uh, diagnostic literature uh, that are not on any other scale in the BASC. And I'll show you that on the next slide and how that plays out. So in designing the content for the autism scale, the DSD scale, 
we include a significant number of adaptability items, as you see there, a significant number of withdrawal items. Uh, that makes sense. That's where we uh, found the original evidence to suggest we had enough items to measure autism and to diagnose it with uh, considerable accuracy. We also have adaptability adaptability items because with all scales we want to have positively worded items with negatively worded items to be more aligned with uh, the notion mm -hmm. of assessing strengths uh, but at the same time uh, to mitigate response sets so you don't have all negative items. Then we have functional communication in the same vein, social skills. And then what you see there in the middle are three uh, specific autism scale items or DSC items, avoid eye contact, repetitive movements, and uh, showing emotions. So uh, this is the inner workings of the autism scale, anger, control, bullying, all the content scales on the PRS, TRS, and SRP are constructed in the same way. So our first goal with the BAS-3 to improve all the scales with better content coverage. Second goal was to improve reliability for all scales. The third goal was to improve validity, and this slide uh, that I have up on the screen now is associated with that third goal. So this is criterion-related validity for the autism scale. And you see here on the top, we're essentially correlating the uh, BASC 3 DSD scale with the autism spectrum rating scales, in mm -hmm. this case for two to five year olds. And if you look at the uh, right hand column there, uh, it's a very busy slide I know, but you see the total uh, autism spectrum rating scale score on the right hand side there, the first coefficient is 0.43. If you move your eyes down the page toward the bottom, you'll see a 0.61 correlation coefficient between the BASC-3 autism scale, DSD, and the total score on the autism spectrum rating scales. So uh, that's not surprising, and it suggests that the autism score on the BASC-3, that is the DSD score, is in fact a measure of the autism construct. We have slides for parent ratings here. Again, you look down the right-hand column, and you'll see a 0.63 correlation between DSD and the autism spectrum rating scales. Again, showing that that score is doing what we intended it to do, and that's to function as uh, an autism scale that you can have some confidence in. All right, so that's the inner workings of the autism scale, but all these content scales are constructed the same way. Here we have emotional self-control executive functioning, negative emotionality, which comes from the temperament literature. Um, and if you have a child uh, who shows a lot of negative emotions early in development, at the uh, preschool level, for example, uh, that suggests significant risk uh, because that might be an indicator of the so-called difficult temperament from the Thomas and Chess research of the 1960s. All right, then we have uh, resiliency. So those are your content scales. These are the very, uh, various scoring options, paper, digital, et cetera. Uh, those of you who use the BASC-3 are very familiar with these scoring options. Um, the paper option um, is sometimes useful. Uh, I've done training, uh, for example, in Alaska, where you might have a psychologist who's serving children on many different islands and uh, Wi-Fi might not be available. Uh, so a paper option is uh, important in some unusual circumstances um, and, and uh, hand scoring. Then the hybrid is essentially the BAS2 scoring methodology. And for the hybrid procedure, you do do with the BAS2, hand out a paper form, and then enter it into QGlobal to do the scoring and uh, reporting. I used to advise this option. I no longer do that uh, because the digital option is, is improved to such a significant extent. It pretty much makes the hybrid option irrelevant 
The advantages, if you've not transitioned to the VAS3 yet, of the digital option are increasing routinely as, um, as the software's um, improved. Uh, I shouldn't say software, as the uh, scoring is improved. So uh, with the digital option, it functions like a Dropbox. All of your VASC results are there. You no longer have uh, incomplete item responses uh, because of the, the way the uh, forms are digitally delivered to parents and teachers um, or uh, taken online by a student or youth. So the digital ad administration scoring solves a lot of practical problems uh, that we had with the hybrid approach on the VAS 2. Um, and it continues to be improved. And that's one of the advantages of this option should you transition to the VAS 3 is it's, it can be continuously improved uh, without uh, your having to ask to have that done. So I would advise if you're transitioning to the 3, you go to the Pearson Clinical website um, and you go to the VAS portion of that and, and uh, push the training button there. And what you'll see is a number of related webinars by Anne Marie Kimball, who's helping out with this one, um, and others uh, from Pearson, who do a really nice job of describing in tremendous detail how the scoring and reporting is done uh, for the rating scales um, and other components of the, uh, the screening measure, et cetera, other components of the, uh, uh, the BASC-3. So, uh, Take advantage of that uh, training if you wish. Hand scoring, I'm going to skip. And this is just an example of output, and this looks firstly identical to the BAS2 output. So the, the Q Global output looks very familiar to you. The intervention recommendations look very familiar to you. This is the same format um, as was used with the BAS2. This is important. So we have the behavioral intervention guide. Um, senior authored by Kimber Van Est of Texas A&M. Uh, it's much improved. Uh, it was very comprehensive in the VAS-2. Now it's comprehensive but more user-friendly as well. Uh, it's just easier to find the intervention of the various evidence-based interventions that are included. It's easier to find the supporting research. Um, it's reorganized in a way that it's easier to uh, jog your memory as a clinician about the various elements associated with an intervention. Uh, but most importantly, the behavioral intervention guide is fully integrated uh, with QGlobal. Um, so uh, it's available digitally for lookup, um, but if, uh, if you get the basic scoring and the basic scoring plus the intervention guide, uh, options, which I would re recommend for the BAS-3 because it's just like marginally more expensive, just a few dollars. Um, essentially, what Q Global will do, it, was, it will deliver all the features of the Behavioral Intervention Guide to you in the output. And so here, we see primary improvement areas, hyperactivity and depression in this case, and they're delivered to you based on, upon the fact they have the two most deviant T-scores, the two highest T-scores. Secondary improvement areas, which you might need to want to address in thinking about treatment planning for a child are included here, and these are gonna be scores between 60 and 69. And then for every um, child evaluated, we include adaptive skills strengths that have been identified so you can build on those strengths as part of the treatment planning, intervention planning process. So um, this is a great supplement to your clinical judgment about where to focus treatment, where to focus intervention, but this gives you empirical support for that decision making uh, by essentially sort of um, working through the logic based upon the derived scores of where you might want to focus your efforts. And you'll notice here, uh, for each of the scales that are a primary or secondary area of improvement, it lists items for you. And these are not real items. Uh, these are analogs of real items on the basque. 
these can be valuable in conferences with parents, teachers, treatment providers, because it allows you to, to describe what you mean by hyperactivity as assessed by the VASC using a very using a very accessible language and using examples of behaviors without giving away the actual BASC item content. I encourage people that I train with the BASC 3 to use these fake items, these analog items in their psych reports, their oral, oral presentations of results, uh, because they're very descriptive. They tell the uh, consumer the information exactly what's been measured, and yet they protect the item content. So I would uh, feel free if I were you to cut and paste some of the phrasing from the Q Global reports, including this intervention report on the past three. Here's a little bit more detail from the intervention uh, reporting included in Q Global. Uh, and so for each uh, evidence-based intervention you might want to employ to deal with hyperactivity, uh, you get a full menu here of seven evidence-based interventions. Most of these have at least one randomized controlled trial supporting their usage. And all this research Kimber puts in the, in the behavioral intervention guide. Um, at a minimum, they have at least some very strong quasi-experimental designs. So, uh, so if you choose one of these seven interventions to recommend or to employ in the treatment unit you're working with, for example, um, you can go back to digitally or paper, uh, in paper, go back to the uh, behavioral intervention guide and pull up the specific research studies uh, so that you can feel confident and others can feel confident that you are recommending tried and true interventions. By the way, you'll notice here and in the big, you don't see a lot of new interventions, mindfulness, for example, and some of those, because they haven't been the beneficiaries of long-term research and often not large-scale, well-funded, randomized control trials. So these are really well-worn practices because they had to be, they had to exist for two, three, or four, or five decades in order to amass enough research to give us really good confidence in their usage. So that's why you might not see some interventions that have gained popularity in the last two, five, or even ten years for that matter. So that's a quick overview of um, the output. Uh, these are DSM-5 considerations, and these are included in the output. Left-hand side, uh, Pearson obtained permission from the uh, American Psychiatric Association to reproduce the symptoms here. And so these are the, the symptoms from the DS5, DSM-5 on the left-hand side. The ones that are checked are checked because you see on the right-hand side, in each case you see one or in some cases three items which are assessing the same symptom or behavior. So they're aligned on the right-hand side. Uh, and so this is really looking like a case of ADHD, uh, hyperactivity, impulsivity type at least. Uh, because of the alignment with the DSM-5 symptomatology. Also on the Pearson website, there is a very thorough description of the privacy associated with Q-Global storage, uh, storage, and so I want you to be aware of that. This is just uh, uh, the link given here at the top of the page. I encourage you to read the multiple pages that are associated with uh, privacy. So, um, and you can kind of get hint, a hint here that Pearson was very concerned about this, this as well and probably anticipated the many questions that you and I had about uh, security and privacy of results um, and thus went to great lengths to maintain that. So I'll let you look that up on your own, but it's, it's important. And then um, at the same time, I want to provide you with a caveat regarding the DSM-5. The DSM-5, as you see here in the former director, Tom Insull of the National Institutes of Health of the U.S., um, cited significant problems with its validity. So although we use the DSM-5, we are appropriately cautious about its use as well uh, because it has some nagging validity problems that have been associated with the previous editions 
that have not been fully resolved with the DSM-5, uh, which is why uh, Dr. Insel suggested uh, that in many research studies funded by the U.S. federal government, the DSM-5 would not be used as the diagnostic standard. So that's the DSM-5 caveat to keep in mind. And uh, moving to the composite scales on the TRSP, on, on the TRS and PRS, they're the same. Um, uh, there it is. Okay, the new clinical indexes. Uh, these are new scales on the uh, BASC-3, and uh, they're the only new interpretive scales, and they're intended not to replace existing subscale scores or composite scores, but, but to provide some value added. So as part of the validation process of the BASC-3, Pearson was able to collect a very large number of kids with an ADHD diagnosis, a very large number of kids with an autism diagnosis. And this is only relevant if you work in the United States, but if you work in the United States, you work in the schools and you work under U.S. special education regulations, then the emotional behavior disorder category will be relevant, but that's a U.S. specific category. So focusing on ADHD and autism, for example, uh, they're available at the child and adolescent levels only on the teacher and parent rating scales. And they're intended as an additional score to make you feel more or less confident about making an ADHD or autism diagnosis. So, uh, so for the case of ADHD, for example, you might have elevated scores of about 70 on attention problems, 65 on hyperactivity, and an ADHD probability index that suggests that this is not a case of ADHD. Well, that would indicate you might want to look at the history and see if the history is not fully consistent with ADHD. Alternatively, if you had that same set of scores and the ADHD probability index says, yes, the items that were acknowledged by this parent or teacher were virtually identical to the items identified by teachers and parents of kids with ADHD, then you might feel much more comfortable saying this is a case of ADHD. So it provides you with kind of a tipping point, if you will, in the interpretation process uh, to help you feel more confident about a diagnostic conclusion of ADHD or autism or slightly less confident. Same thing for emotional behavior disorders from um, uh, the U.S. perspective, and that makes you feel more confident that this is a special education eligible case versus not eligible. Clinical probability for preschoolers, uh, because we're often loath to diagnose preschoolers because we don't want to stigmatize young children, um, and especially since diagnoses can be less accurate at younger ages. We just took all the participants in the clinical sample who had any sort of diagnosis at the preschool level and group them to add this little value added index here. So uh, clinical probability index just tells you, is this child like others who carry a diagnosis at the preschool level versus not? And then functional impairment is new, comes from the psychiatric literature. It's, it's certainly not new conceptually, it's been around for a long time. And with functional impairment, what we're trying to do is to answer the question, okay, this child or adolescent has a mental health disorder. Do they have functional impairment? And I'll give you an example of that. When we were doing uh, some of our screening research in the Los Angeles Unified School District, uh, we identified a number of children and adolescents who had a mental health disorder and no one knew it because they didn't have functional impairment. At one of the high schools, for example, um, our, uh, uh, one of the girls uh, completed the self-report screener on the behavioral emotional screening system, and she identified herself as very significantly clinically depressed. The shocking thing about the case is that no one suspected it because she was the president of the student body. She was getting straight A's. She was very popular. She was identified as a leader. So that's a 
great example of a case of a mental health disorder, but she probably does not warrant special education services at school. She probably warrants medication, individual counseling psychotherapy, group counseling psychotherapy. She warrants intervention to mitigate the depression, but, um, but she's not showing functional impairment. So uh, for special education eligibility in the U.S. at least, you have to have indication of functional impairment, and that's what that scale tells you. So that's a new feature, um, and it's important when you're, when you're making the differentiation of special education eligibility, at least by U.S. standards versus not. So there are a number of clinical uh, profiles here, and uh, you'll see the same pattern on each one, in that the scales intended to assess the clinical problem area, the disorder, tend to be the most elevated. And here it's hyperactivity on the left, and the other set of high scores in the middle for parents and teachers' attention problems. So we've covered four types of validity for the scales. Content, I'm sorry, four types of psychometric evidence, excuse me. Content validity, reliability, criterion related validity, and this is uh, uh, the third type of validity evidence, the fourth type of psychometric evidence and that is differential or clinical validity. Do the scales that are supposed to differentiate one disorder from another actually do that? And that's why I give you this information in these slides. And what you see is that's typically the case. Here, for all the clinical samples, you're going to have impairment in positive functioning. Uh, you'll need to build some skills in these kids. Uh, ADHD, what you see is the two most elevated scales are um, externalized, or the ADHD probability index uh, and executive functioning, not surprising. For autism, the highest scores are atypicality and withdrawal, as I promised you earlier. Very poorly developed adaptive competencies, and here it's the autism probability index and the developmental social disorder scale, the autism scale. So these are very predictable results. Emotional behavior disorders, I'm going to cycle quickly, bipolar. Just quickly for bipolar, what you see is a more deviant clinical profile, and you see the externalizing problems combined with the internalizing problems at very elevated levels, and that differentiates that population. Okay, uh, the tragedies with uh, regard to sports injuries are um, much more uh, publicized today than has been uh, even four or five years ago. This is one of the reasons why we work so hard to uh, revise and significantly improve the executive functioning scale. So hidden inside of the VAS now, um, you have a fully functioning autism scale uh, that you can have more confidence in, and you have a fully functioning uh, executive functioning scale with subscales. So for example, Mauricio's a former student, um, and he's, uh, if you're in Canada, he's at the University of Victoria, uh, BC, uh, in the psych department there, and he's an exceptional uh, mid-career, early to mid-career uh, neuroscientist who is unusual because he developed some terrific competencies in measurement at the same time. So he brings a really uh, strong perspective to executive functioning in that he knows the neuroscience literature, but also measurement science as well. You see that reflected in this article in Psychological Assessment, which is a summary of his dissertation research. Then, uh, and Mauricio has about a half dozen studies now and more in the works. So he's isolated based upon neuroscience research and theory and factor analysis, um, an executive functioning overall index to indicate whether there are problems associated with, for example, the concussion the child had last year versus not. And then these four subscale sub scores, which don't uh, really function until age six. But at age six and above, you can sort out 
the uh, areas of impairment for uh, intervention remediation therapy. What you might see first are some confusion post-concussion uh, that would uh, show up in the problem solving index, maybe some attentional control, and, um, and then maybe with more significant injury, more long-term injury, maybe a high school or college student with seven or eight concussions, you might see more impulsivity, more behavioral control, uh, and you might see more emotional lability, uh, such as uh, you know, just weepiness with more severe problems. So, um, so that's the executive functioning scale, and we owe a great debt of gratitude to uh, Dr. Garcia Barrero. In Q Global, uh, it gives you the items by subscale so that you can get a better sense for describing to a parent or other uh, stakeholder what problem solving means or what behavioral control means when it's impaired. So this is intended to help you communicate with others. Interpretation principles, I'm going to spend a little time on this. I saved this for my five, six hour workshops on the fast three. Uh, just briefly, uh, the research suggests that all raters provide valuable information. That's important. Because uh, you might find uh, you see a very high rating of indicating a lot of problems that you distrust, uh, a non-deviant rating, this child or adolescent saying they have no problems. Um, there's considerable research to show that those writing, those disagreeing ratings might be uh, the best estimate of the person giving the rating. They may not be significantly tainted by response uh, indexes or response sets, I should say. The SRP remains intact. Um, attitude towards school and measure and teachers is indicated as a measure of, of school engagement. Sensation seeking is associated with sensation seeking behaviors, but not highly correlated with alcohol abuse, as you see here at this 0.39 coefficient. Atypicality will have a number of false positives, hence we don't call it psychoticism, so that you don't have to explain away a high psychoticism score. Locus of control denotes an external locus of control. Social stress is one of two peer scales we have. Social stress is negative. Interpersonal relations is positive. So these two scales are highly negatively correlated. You have anxiety, depression, sense of inadequacy, which are the cognitions associated with depression and somatization. So you have a four scale internalizing measure to more thoroughly flesh out that symptomatology. You have a two-scale uh, ADHD measure. And then beginning at age uh, 18, for the 18 to 25-year-old version, for those that you might be working in post-secondary education, college, university, um, other sorts of post-secondary training schools, um, alcohol abuse, and uh, their adaptation to that schooling environment. Adaptive scales are the same as before. Uh, Self-esteem is negatively correlated 0.67 with depression. I want to make you aware of that. <coughs> Excuse me. You should expect higher levels of depression and sense of inadequacy to be correlated with lower levels of self-esteem. Okay. Um, moving on to the content scales, you see a number of new items here. So you can have more confidence in the anger control, ego strength, mania, test anxiety scales. We have a self-report of personality um, interview edition for ages six and seven. This is one area where for those of you who use the SRPI on the VAS2, will not have transfer training to the VAS-3. We completely overhauled it. Uh, Rob Altman at Pearson did a really nice job of overhauling this scale. Uh, it's just much better. It's brief. Um, 
Uh, I don't assess six and seven year olds with great frequency, but uh, I've asked audience members to report on this. And they're telling me that this is taking less time than even I had anticipated, about five minutes actually, six, seven minutes. It's very much like a Vineland where you ask uh, 14 questions and then follow-up questions to flesh out the details on those. So it's a semi-structured sort of measure. Um, and uh, in that way, it provides more of an open response uh, format for six and seven-year-olds. And uh, you might get richer clinical data. This is what it looks like. Uh, this is the format. You ask item one, and then you follow up with one B and one C. Um, uh, if they answer no to item one, you follow up with um, one D, E, and F. Very quick, as you can imagine, going through these 14 questions. And then uh, what the manual gives you are the frequency of the responses um, as uh, thematically categorized based upon the normative sample. So for item 10, about a third of six and seven year olds in the normative sample indicate they feel sad. In the follow-up items, um, about 40% of that 34% said it was due to problems with others, such as you see here. And about 38% uh, um, said it's, another 38% said it was primarily due to loneliness or grief. So you can see how different this is. It, it is, in fact, a true interview um, in the BAS 3. In the BAS 2, it was kind of a, really a warmed over checklist. And so I think this is going to be a clinically more rich measure. Uh, and that's what people who use it have been telling me thus far. The normative information, virtually identical to the BAS 2. Not going to spend much time on this. Um, the norm sample sizes uh, are here. And these reliability coefficients are either the same or better than they were on the BASC-2 because that was our goal with the improving item content because that improves the accuracy of your measure and improves your confidence in interpretation. These are male-female differences, virtually identical to the BASC-2. Uh, this is for a longer presentation. I'm going to cycle through these pretty quickly so I can move on to introducing you at least to some additional components. So Flex Monitor, um, and this includes uh, the measures we um, had for the uh, BASC-2, where we have some uh, short forms of uh, constructs on the uh, BASC-3. We have a short form autism monitor, we have an externalizing monitor for the self-report, we have the self-regulation monitor. These range from anywhere from 8 to 17 items. And so if you want to, if you're working in a you know, particularly controlled treatment program or intervention program on a self-contained classroom and the teacher wants to see what progress the kids are making, uh, he or she can fill out a teacher rating scale on the kids, one or two or all the kids in the small classroom. Uh, on a weekly basis, every two weeks, once a month, over the course of an academic year, to see if the curriculum is working. Um, similarly, for um, a child in a therapy group or an adolescent in a therapy group, they could fill out a self-report monitor one of these short ones every uh, every group session, uh, and then you could track change over time. Uh, but the Flex Monitor refers to the option of creating your own customized form. And so in QGlobal, uh, you have the option of doing this, and uh, you can select 20, 30, 40 items that you want to use for evaluating your counseling services, your social work services, your therapy groups, or whatever, um, and uh, select the items you want from the BASC-3. Uh, calculate the reliability because we have item data on these items. If you find it's good, um, and good I would say is 0.90 or above. Um, for that many items, 0.80 is not very good. And so if you really want accuracy, I would set a minimum uh, goal of 0.85, preferably 0.90 for your 
customized monitor, your flex monitor. And then individuals who are members of the, of the team, if all the psychologists, for example, in a school district or something can, something can access this uh, flex monitor and, uh, and use it with parents, teachers, student self-report on a periodic basis to answer questions about, you know, is this intervention working for an individual child or is the individual counseling we're doing uh, across the school district working. So it could can, it can be an individual monitoring tool, but more of a program evaluation monitoring tool as well. So that's available. Uh, it's, a, you know, it's an interesting, unusual offering uh, that, um, uh, that I think some large services are going to partic uh, find it particularly useful, large service units, I should say. That's what the form looks like. The student observation system is the same as it was on the BAS-2, but now it's practical for the first time because it's fully digital. So you can enter a classroom with your smartphone, enter a classroom with your tablet, enter a classroom uh, with your uh, laptop, um, and do a momentary time sampling, clinician's checklist. It's just hundreds of percent better than it was previously because now it's practical. Uh, since it's digital, it does the timing for the momentary time sampling, so you don't have to stress about that. Uh, so the SOS, I would say, although we created this in 1992, is for the first time practical. And another question we received beginning in 1992 as well with the original VASC is, why don't you have the structured developmental history available digitally? We finally do for the VAS-3, and that's important because you can get this qualitative information and you can cut and paste it into your reports. Um, so you have an incredibly different level of convenience. You can send it digitally home, uh, mother uh, and or father uh, or other parental figure can, can complete it, return it digitally to you. Um, and then that gives you access to quotes uh, that they might include in their responses or specific item responses and makes it much easier to do oral reporting or written reporting. So the history is now digital and so the structured developmental history is more practical than it has ever been. So SOS, STH are now exceedingly practical. Parenting relationship questionnaire, the PRQ. Uh, this is very similar to the BAS-2, but uh, new item content as well. And from the um, parent's perspective, you're assessing the parent-child relationship. And for those of you who used it previously, it has the same scales, preschool level, child adolescent level. As you can see by the scale, um, it's useful in questions of adoption, uh, child custody, um, we get a number of emails uh, from uh, countries outside the U.S. about international adoptions uh, to assess attachment. Um, so uh, the only clinical scale I want to mention here is relational frustration at the bottom. And that's a euphemistic term for parental perceptions of their own stress associated with parenting. And what we didn't want to do is offer stressed parents a stress scale, as you can imagine, and this is why we disguise the name of it and call it relational frustration. All right. Any other things here? This is our work on prevention. I will cycle through it rather quickly. Um, so we get to the behavioral and emotional screening system. This is the best, whoops, excuse me. Uh, this is what it looks like in the Spanish version, English and Spanish versions. 28 items on the self-report. This is intended for entire school screening for all kids in a high school or selected grade levels or in a middle school or self-report can be used in fourth and fifth grades because of the readability level. Uh, the reason I feature the self-report here is because uh, in conversations with school systems that are doing 
universal screening for mental health risk, behavioral and emotional risk, the self-report is just more practical because it doesn't take any teacher time, uh, doesn't take any parent time. And in Q Global, it's delivered digitally. Um, and um, in Review 360 um, also allows you to deliver it digitally in groups. So you can run kids through the computer lab at school, and they can all take the self-report, and you can get a group report and individual reports on the risk. Or um, kids can pull out their smartphones or their tablets uh, if they're available, um, and you can screen an, our, an entire school in one class period, like a planning period. I don't have much time to uh, talk about this today, but as you can see from these slides, a great bit of work has been done. Uh, I'm going to move to skill building. One thing that's kind of a little secret of the BAS 3 is that it has a social emotional learning curriculum for use by regular classroom teachers. Uh, and it's hidden in, uh, in this uh, compendium by Kimber and colleagues called the Behavioral and Emotional Skill Building Guide. And it is a tier one or universal social emotional curriculum. In this slide you see that it's articulated to standards for social emotional learning and that um, if you teach children respect, it might address these clinical problems or mitigate them, problem solving and cooperation. And it includes lessons such as this um, about respect, uh, using a, an example from uh, zoology. These are very accessible to teachers. You'll see that they look just like teacher lesson plans. Uh, these were designed by Kimber essentially like the BASC in that they should require no training of teachers. A teacher, because of their training and work with lesson plans, should be able to pick this up and uh, whenever they want, provide SEL, social emotional learning, uh, lessons and integrate them with topics such as this, biology, zoology, <coughs> excuse me, into their everyday teaching. Uh, late elementary grade, middle school, and high school. Uh, here's some more uh, worksheet. And uh, those of you who are teachers, you'll know that this is not foreign, uh, this sort of approach that looks like a lesson plan. And then, for kids who are identified by the screener by having some, is having some risk uh, above a T-score of about 60, um, we include a, uh, a group format uh, where you can um, uh, enroll children in, or adolescents in an eight-week group where in um, the first group, which lasts 30 to 40 minutes, you can send kids down to the counselor's uh, room and the counselor can uh, go through the first lesson on establishing group expectations regarding confidentiality, etc. At the last group, give the behavioral and emotional screening self-report as an outcome measure to assess progress based on baseline. And what you see here are six behaviors that address a great variety of externalizing and internalizing problems. And here we're focusing on a positive psychology approach on teaching new skills to kids uh, to enhance their interpersonal, social um, uh, adaptation in school and out. And uh, this is what these mm. essentially lesson plans look like, uh, listening effectively, And this is the procedure. And we've used this in Los Angeles and elsewhere in the skill building guide. Um, <clears throat> these groups have been conducted by guidance counselors, guidance counseling interns from the local university, psychiatric social worker, uh, a uh, lead teacher who has a bachelor's in psychology and enjoys this sort of work, school psychologists, um, et cetera. So any individual who has some level of comfort with group guidance 
um, uh, should be able to pick these up as well and teach these seven aspects of um, listening effectively. And in one of our schools in uh, Los Angeles, um, as this paper presentation shows, uh, for these 46 kids out of this high school of 1,000 that were included in these groups, um, they got better after being in the group. The internalizing group improved substantially. The externalizing, uh, about a quarter of them improved overall, it's about a third of the kids. But this is significant improvement. These are kids that moved from the, beyond a T-score of 60 to below a T-score of 60. So they moved from somewhere in the, in the at-risk or severe risk range into the normal range. All of the 46 kids moved in the right direction. You know, so some may have gone from 77 to 76, for example. Uh, so at least we know in this pilot study it doesn't do harm. So we saw um, some significant improvement there. And this is the big behavioral intervention guide I described at the outside of our, um, outside of our uh, presentation. So the Pearson site gets richer every day, um, thanks to Anne-Marie Kimball and others who post webinars and instructional um, uh, information there for you. Uh, so if you're considering moving to the BASC-3, um, you will find that it in a rich resource and an increasingly rich resource. And so that's why I give you the, the, uh, link, uh, the link there for that. So that's my uh, quick introduction to the BASC-3. I hope you find it helpful. Um, and we have a few minutes left. So I will work with Anne-Marie to do my best to answer any questions uh, that you pose to her. Hey, Randy, thank you so much. I'm sorry I was trying to finish answering a question. Um, sure. We don't have a lot of outstanding questions, but I have left a couple that, that I didn't feel comfortable answering. One is about uh, the college form, and I know you mentioned um, that it continues to ask questions about alcohol, but this, yes. this person is asking about marijuana use, which they have found has replaced alcohol use. Any comments around around that issue? Yes, uh, we uh, decided not to tackle marijuana use. So that the only substance assessed uh, by the college form is alcohol. So it is limited in that respect. Uh, that would require some follow-up questioning uh, in addition to the uh, SRP college edition. All right, we've got one about how frequently or how often should you update a PRS um, parent, I guess, P yes, PRS P, so PRS preschool and a PRQ with the same client in a treatment program? Uh, those are good questions. Uh, if they're in treatment and you want to get a sense for how they're responding to treatment, uh, are they staying the same, are they getting better, are they getting worse? then you want to administer it with greater frequency. So a pre-test, post-test design is pretty weak, um, you know, because it only gives you two data points. And so if you really want to see if a child is responding to treatment in that treatment program, uh, you, you would want to give the forms more frequently, or the progress monitoring forms more frequently, which would be, and the good news about these forms is it doesn't look like there's much inter-item uh, dependence, um, and so uh, and very few, uh, very little practice effect, in other words. So that means you could give them monthly, you could give them every six weeks, perhaps even every two weeks, if you're really interested in progress monitoring. And that's why we created those shorter progress monitoring forms. If you want to update a full measure, uh, and you want to do a pre-test, post-test design, you know, that may be six months. Um, from initiation to ending treatment, but that's not a very powerful assessment of the effects of treatment. At a minimum, I would do initiation, mid-treatment, end of treatment, and six-week follow-up. You know, at a minimum of four data points to help you feel better about the efficacy of treatment. 
Thank you. And then someone is now asking about using the BAS-3. Can we use the BAS-3 effectively with private therapy patients? Absolutely. Uh, it was designed for that purpose as well. And I'm sorry I'm getting over a cold here. I'm just getting my voice back, so excuse my cough. Uh, the, um, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, what you tend to see are different results. So if you're working in private therapy where a referral might be made by this, uh, an individual, him or herself, an 18-year-old, a 22-year-old, um, you might see the self-report to, to indicate the most problems. Or if they're referred by parents and not by teachers, you might see the parents indicating the most problems. And that's because the person bringing the concern is more likely to know the problems best. I basically stole that idea from Dave Lachar, the legendary creator of the personality inventory for children. And his wisdom he shared with me in a presentation one time was the most deviant rating, one that indicates the most problems, is by the rater that knows the problems best. And that's an important reframe. Instead of thinking the most deviant rater is the person with the response set. There's very little evidence of response sets. Uh, it's usually due to knowing the problems best. Okay, and I was busy typing a response to um, the only other unanswered question at the moment, and that is about, again, progress monitoring. With a client who's showing up maybe in private practice twice a month, what would be the suggested measurement frequency? I would do it twice a month because you don't have the inter item, uh, interdepend or inter -item dependence. So uh, you, could, you could use uh, a full form or a shorter progress monitoring form after each visit. If that uh, seems burdensome from a financial perspective or a time perspective, uh, once a month would make sense. It's kind of like medication. You, know, you would expect medication um, to uh, become effective you know, in two weeks or so. Um, and, um, and that's when a physician will ask, you know, is the medication working? Um, and so uh, about as frequently as, as you assess medication effects and titrate them every two weeks, once a month, but with some frequency because it gives you better data, it gives you more confidence in your decision making. I don't have any additional unanswered questions, Dr. Kamphouse. Thank you very much for, again, a very thorough explanation of the revision of BAS-3 and all of the components, including the new flex monitor. Um, thank, thank you, Nuri. Bye, everyone.